this month's uh, edition of our analysis quantum fields and probability seminar. Um, I'm very happy to have Laszlo Erdős as a speaker today. Let me introduce him very uh, briefly. So Laszlo studied in uh, Budapest uh, with Tomoko Sass, uh, then went on to do his uh, PhD uh, at Princeton University under the supervision of Elliot Lee. And then he spent uh, a year as a postdoc in Zurich at ETH. And then he was for several years at Courant Institute before becoming a faculty member at Georgia Institute of Technology. Then he, um, he actually moved to Munich and spent 10 years at the University of Munich as a chair of numerical analysis. And uh, before moving to the uh, Institute of Science and Technology in near Vienna in Austria. And Laszlo has made so many important contributions. Let me just mention a few. So uh, starting with uh, work on, on uh, showing operators with magnetic fields, and then uh, lots of things in quantum dynamics about Boltzmann equations, diffusion, and uh, also uh, many body dynamics in the gauss pitayevsky regime. And uh, then uh, importantly also um, with Yao and uh, Schlein, the work on um, random matrices and universality properties. And the uh, random matrices is what he has been focusing on the last few years. And today's talk is about the connection to eigenstate normalization hypothesis. Lastly, please go ahead. Okay, Thank, thanks very much for this very nice introduction. Thanks very much for inviting me uh, to give this talk in this nice seminar. It's unfortunate that everything goes on Zoom, but on the other hand, I see it has the advantage that really we have an audience from all over the world. So it's very nice to see at least over Zoom all these friends. So I'm, I'm going to talk about a joint work together with Giorgio Cipolloni, who is just a finishing PhD student, and Dominic Schroeder, who was a postdoc with me in the last few years. He was also a student previously with me. So if there are any questions during the talk, just please stop me and or raise this hand or something, indicate. Um, okay, so let me just start from the very beginning. So I will explain a little bit what quantum ergodicity and this eigenstate thermalization story is. So it goes back to, to something very old, some very old idea, the quantum ergodicity, which is uh, in very informal terms says that eigenfunctions of the quantization of a chaotic classical dynamics are uniformly distributed in the phase space. So this is an old uh, general physics picture, physics idea. Here is the most prominent example, well-known example of that. You take the laplace bertrami operator on a surface, which has a chaotic, uh, sufficient if ergodic geodesic flow, and look at its eigen, eigenfunctions, normalized eigenfunctions psi i, and then take, a, take an observable, a precise class I don't want to specify it here, some kind of zero differential operator, and then you look at the overlap, the um, matrix elements of, the, of this A observable in the eigenfunctions. Eigen so psi A, A, psi J. And you look at what this quantity is, where does this converge when the I and J, the, 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 the label of the eigenfunctions go up to infinity. So in other words, you look at the high energy eigenfunction overlaps with any observable. And, uh, and, the, and the statement is that, that it goes basically to the, to the delta function, delta ij, and then integrated out the, the symbol of the zero differential and the unit tangent bundle. So this is the, the typical situation. And uh, I mean, it is, it is a general dream to prove it. It's not very well defined, you know, especially the class of observable, or the class of the A operators is not very well defined. And we're going to state precise theorems and just indicate the, the, the major steps uh, along, this, along the way. So the, the quantum ergodicity, uh, the term of quantum ergodicity refers to the fact that this limit is supposed to hold for most index pairs, allowing, allowing the possibility that maybe there are some exceptional index pairs, i and j, typically with zero density where this does not hold. Or sometimes one formulates it in such a way that one takes some average some local average in i and j. 
And in that case, it has been proven, this is the Schneerman and Leighton Zelvic Kolanda Verdier quantum ergodicity version. Later, it has been also proven a discrete version of that on large regular graphs. This was a famous work of Anantara Manandel Masson. Uh, all these things are about quantum ergodicity, so not necessarily about each individual I and J. But then Rudnik and Sarnak formulated their very famous conjecture, which is the quantum unique ergodicity conjecture. The word unique refers to the fact that this limit is supposed to hold for all pairs without any exceptions. And this is only this was proven only for very special cases for arithmetic surfaces in famous works of Linda Strauss. So this is sort of the situation about uh, about the general quantum unique ergodicity. Uh, furthermore, one could ask the question, uh, what is the speed of convergence? So once you have a limiting statement, what happens to the, how fast this convergence takes place? And as usual, the physicists always have much bolder uh, vision about that. So there's a physics prediction going back to Feingold and Perez and also other people who ask about the variance of this quantity, which is roughly speaking the square of the speed of convergence. And the, and the idea was the, the prediction is that in, in most cases, not always, but in typical situations is the inverse of the Heisenberg time, which is roughly the same as the local eigenvalue spacing in the high energy regime. Now, this would be a dream statement. Uh, much, much weaker, much, much slower decay has been proven and those only in the average sense by Zerdich and Schubert. Uh, and this is actually that the, the, the decay is much slower in a, for, for um, um, a general situation is not a surprising situation. Uh, it's not a surprise actually when the spectrum is highly degenerate, which itself is a, is a non-typical, atypical situation, then the, this logarithmic decay is actually optimal. But then one would hope that, that away, uh, apart from some specific situation, actually the, the, the decay is much faster, or rather the speed of convergence is much faster. And this has been so far proven only for special arithmetic surfaces where some kind of polynomial decay in the energy variable has been, and the polynomial decay has been proven, and also some very special linear maps on the, on the torus. So this is the situation about uh, the speed of convergence for general uh, systems. Now, we are not going to do that. Uh, we're not going to work with very general systems. We go back to Wigner matrices. Using this idea of, of Eugene Wigner, he has, of course, this big vision saying that the energy levels of large quantum systems can be modeled by eigenvalues of large random matrices. Here, land, random matrix can, be, can come in very different forms, but what Wigner had in mind is what nowadays called the Wigner matrix, which is just, just a large Hermitian matrix with, with IID entries, IID independent identical distributed entries. Uh, now, I mean, originally this was this, this vision came up in the, in the context of level spacing, modeling the, the, the energy gaps in, in heavy nuclei, but it can be also extended in other situations, for example, in the quantum chaos setup, which I mentioned before. Simply random matrices uh, are very, very typical models of chaotic quantum systems, in some sense, very simple models of chaotic quantum systems. Hence, this quantum unique ergodicity is expected to hold for Wigner matrices as well. And because the system is so much chaotic, probably even with optimal speed formulated by physicists. And this is actually has been formulated uh, by Deutsch as a physicist, as a physics conjecture. This is called the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. Uh, and actually we proved it. So this is our main theorem, which in physics terms would correspond to this a Deutsch uh, conjecture. So let me state the theorem more precisely. So we talk about Wigner matrices. I will put some more precise condition of Wigner matrices a bit later. Um, a large n by n Wigner matrix and consider its normalized eigenvectors ui and consider it uh, uh, bounded deterministic matrix, deterministic observable A. The important thing that the, that, that the observable has to be deterministic, so there should not be any conspiracy between A and the Wigner matrix. And then you look at the overlaps, this we call overlaps of the eigenfunctions with the observable A, so simply the quadratic forms of Ui, A, U, J, and you want to know what this quantity typically is. Of course, it's a random quantity, um, but uh, the, the fact is what you uh, what we get is that this becomes deterministic is delta ij 
times A, times the average of A, which is just the average trace of the observer bar. So it's a very, it's a, it's a, it's a very, uh, very rude, very crude way of equi equilibration. It says that basically the UI and UJ, these are acting some, you can think of them as very random vectors in the high dimensional space. And then their, action, their, uh, their effect on, the, on, on this quadratic form is just that picks up the, uh, the, the trace, average trace of the observer bar. And more importantly, or more, uh, more importantly we, get, uh, we get a speed of convergence. So we find that this quantity is essentially one over square root of n up to, between n to the epsilon. It also holds uniformly in, the, in all the indices. So it's not like that there are ex exceptional indices as was in the original uh, quantum ergodicity. It holds in the quantum unique ergodicity sense. And it also holds in a high probability sense. I didn't write it up very precisely, but it means this is a random object, the right hand side is deterministic. But it basically means that, that with very, very high probability, this holds, and the high probability is some n to the minus 100. So it's a very strong state, statement in this sense as well. Uh, in other words, we can also uh, read it in the way that suppose that A is, A has, A is traceless. That's actually a more interesting situation when this term is not here. And then it basically says that the eigenbasis, which is a bunch of orthogonal normalized vectors, is, asy is asymptotically orthogonal to A acting on the same eigenbasis. So the eigenbasis is, a, is, is, is one set of n vectors. A times UJ is another set of n vectors. Of course, this is not orthonormal anymore. So that there are two n vectors in the high dimensional space, and they are asymptotically orthogonal pairwise to each other. The one over square root of n can be understood in such a way that if the UI and the AUJ were simply independently distributed bounded vectors, uh, say according to the hard measure on the very high dimensional sphere, then the typical overlap, the typical scalar product between two randomly chosen um, uh, normalized vector and vector would be exactly one over square root of n. So in this sense, this is this is an optimal bound. It optimally tells you that uh, that the UI and the AUJ are, are as random uh, as possible. So that's the, that's the main statement. It's one of the main statements. So here's again the statement. Now there have been several previous results um, in more restricted sense. So let me go through them uh, very quickly. Uh, so first of all, the, when our statement holds for any deterministic matrix A, but if A is rank one, so it looks like that at Q times Q, rank one observables, a similar statement has been known uh, much earlier. In that case, this statement just says that the UI overlap of any eigenvector with a deterministic vector, uh, everything is normalized to one, has size one over square root of n. And this has been done much earlier. This basically follows from what we call the, the local semicircle law. And there have been many other works specifying this. Uh, this uh, these results are always done by the resolvent method. I will specify it later what I mean by resolvent method. It basically says that one looks at the random matrix and studies very, very carefully its resolvent. Now, once you have something like that, so you have that the UIQ, UI scalar product with Q has a size of order n to the minus one half. And also it has a lot of randomness. It? It's, a random, it's basically a random variable. Then it's very natural to ask what happens if you take the n times the square of that, how does this behave? And this has been proven. This is essentially Gaussian, I mean, more precisely because absolute value square is really like a squared Gaussian with the right normalization, chi square distribution, basically. And this has been proven by Burger and Yao with a very different method. These are using Dyson Brownian motion method. It's a different uh, ball game. And actually it has been done, so the original paper was for a single eigenvalue, eigenvector and a single Q, a test vector, but later on it has been generalized for a joint Gaussian, it even one takes finitely many eigenvectors and finitely many test vectors, so then, then, then you get a, what a K square, uh, basically independent uh, chi square distributed random variable. This is a very recent work by Marcinek and Yao. It's also uh, the Dyson-Brownian motion method. 
So in particular, so these were, these were all basically for rank one, but of course any matrix A and self-adjoint matrix A can be decomposed by spectral theorem in that form. So if you, if you use the, the spectral decomposition and you use the fact that for individual uh, uh, QK rank one projections, you know these results, then one can find that the UI AUI, so this um, the general overlap converges to where it should be in probability. I simply take the, 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 the expectation, the square of the expectation. This will hold for each I, but, but these kind of methods are not sufficient to do, every, to do the whole thing uniform, uh, simultaneously for each I, for, for each I. So probability, but you first fix the I and then you have the conversion, but not all of them at the same time. And, and the simultaneous convergence, simultaneous in I, has been only proven again with DBM methods. All these things are DBM methods, have been proven only with Wigner matrices, which have a Gaussian component. Once you have a small Gaussian component, then DBM is quite effective, and then you can do lots of things. Now, our compared to this previous result, our uh, the novelties of our result up here is that first of all, we used resolvent methods. We don't, do any, we don't use any Dyson Brownian motion here. Our speed of convergence is optimal. This is what's called the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. Uh, we control the limit in, in very high probability, which means that, um, so not only in probability, but in very high probability, which means that you can make it simultaneous in all uh, I and J. And also our method works uniformly in the entire spectrum. And typically these things one proves first at the bulk and then later on at the edge. And then there's also an intermediate regime between the bulk of edge. Our method works immediately for all regimes uniformly in the energy. So this is the, the comparison of our result with the previous, previous works. Now let me go on uh, towards the central limit theorem. If you wish, then this statement, sorry, then this statement is like a law of large number theorem. It says there's a convergence, the UI AUJ, to something where it should convergence with a very good uh, speed of conversion, but it's still a, a low of large number type results. Now it's very natural to us that what if you, you, you normalize it properly, so you put the square root of n on the other side, do you get some kind of central limit theorem? And actually there's a good chance to do that. For example, if you take this uh, spectral decomposition as we did before, you plug it in, then it looks something like that. And then I look, look at this object here, uh, the, the result of Burger and Yao says that this quantity here, the overlap of UI with QK appropriately normalized, this is a Gaussian random variable. Now the spectral theorem requires that take this Gaussian random variable or chi-square distributed random variable for different Ks. And then this, in the spectral theorem, you basically take an average over K of these, uh, of these random variables. So because of your, because this, this other average here, you may hope that there's another central limit theorem effect. So you sum up random variables, maybe it's also central limit theorem. And that's actually uh, expected to be true. And the one over square root of n scaling here up to this n to the epsilon basically tells you that morally it's correct. And this basically, and in particular, it tells you that these overlaps for different uh, Q case, for different case, uh, are so strongly asymptotically independent that the average. Uh, the average follows the central limit, uh, the CRT type scaling. But then, so, so this is consistent with a CRT, but still the question is, is the CRT correct or not? And, and here, the, the, the dyson brownian motion method, which proved the CRT earlier with a single K, this also works for finitely many Ks, when, which in other words means that uh, for finite rank observable, this has been done by the DBM methods, but, but the DBM method is not very well suited, at least not the, not the form which is known nowadays, not very well suited to track many Ks simultaneously. And if you take a general observable, then typically it's a rank N object. And now what we could do with this in the direction of the CRT is that we prove this CRT with a little averaging um, in the index, in the energy index I. So let me read it again more carefully. So again, take a deterministic matrix A, take some index in the bulk. Uh, I mean, we order the eigenvalues. So the, the, the eigenvalue with label one is the smallest one, and label n is the biggest, and these are in the edge. 
So when I, when I require that I0 is somewhere in between, then I say that I'm away from the, from the two edges. And then I take a, 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 tiny, a, a, a tiny epsilon and a k, which is m to the epsilon. And I look at this ui a ui minus its, its expected value. So this is the random variable which is supposed to be after the square root of n scaling, supposed to be a normal Gaussian. We don't, we can't really prove that. But if you average this in the energy variable, a little bit, do a little bit averaging in k, and properly normalize, then our statement is that this becomes a, a normal Gaussian random variable uh, with an effective control, uh, effective speed of convergence uh, and power. Here, the, 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 uh, the expectations of course zero of the Gaussian, center Gaussian, and the variance can be computed by the traceless part of A. So this A circle always means that you take the A minus you subtract its average trace. So this is the traceless part of that. This is the, the guy which really plays the role of the oscillation. So this is the statement. This holds in the back. We have the same statement in the edge, but then the variance gets an additional, a little, little bit different factor. Uh, now the open question is that, uh, which we don't know yet how to do, is that you do the, that to, to do this CRT for a single UI AU. Ah, yeah, I mean, this previous heuristics here tells you that it should be true even without this little averaging in energy, but this we don't know yet how to do. This is something which probably again would require DBM methods. I mean, our method is always uh, a resolvent method. Now, this, pro this problem, as it's stated here, leads to the other, uh, the other topic of the today's discussion, because this is a special case of our general, what we call general functional central limit theorem for Wigner matrices. So this says the following, take W as a Wigner matrix, take a function of that, and then you, you evaluate, you take the partial trace of this function of the Wigner matrix, test it against a deterministic observable deterministic matrix A, and the general function of central metrum says that a quantity like that will be a normal random variable. Now, what you see here, you are done with, it's not so easy to see through, but what you see here is, is, is exactly that type of thing when f becomes, f is a, a function on the spectrum, when f is a characteristic function around the spectrum, on the, in, the, in the spectrum around the typical location of the, of the eigenvalue labeled by I0 with a certain, uh, certain spread, certain width. So let me uh, be more precise about the general function and CRT. This is the second ch section, chapter of our talk. So first, I probably I should define the Wigner matrices. It's not, not, nothing surprising here. So these are n by n uh, Hermitian matrices, uh, independent entries, of course, always up to the Hermitian symmetry. So only, only the elements above the diagonal are independent. Now we assume the identical distribution, but uh, identical distribution really means that the diagonal elements may have a separate distribution than all the off diagonal elements. So we have two uh, fixed and fixed distribution, chi D and chi O D, referring to diagonal and off diagonal. Normalize them appropriately. That's the typical normalization for a Wigner matrix, one over square root of n. And then the diagonal elements follow this distribution, the off diagonal elements follow this other distribution with the appropriate normalization. And we also assume some, for technical reasons, assume the existence of high moments of this model of these basic, basic random variables. Uh, now, um, typically, and then different ways one defines random uh, Wigner uh, semicircle, Wigner matrices. Typically, one assumes that the diagonal and the off diagonal elements have the same distribution. Here, we do a little bit more general, not a big deal, but we know that the diagonal elements may have a different variance. The off diagonal elements have variance one, the diagonal elements may, may differ from one. Nevertheless, the semicircle, Wigner semicircle always holds that some, that's a very robust statement that's really sensitive only to the diagonal, to the off diagonal elements. So here's what the semi, Wigner semicircle all says. It takes, it says that if you take the, 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 the linear statistics, of all the eigenvalues of W, the Wigner matrix, meaning that you value the sum of the F lambda, the one point function of the, of the eigenvalue distribution, then it converges to the average of F against the semicircle distribution. 
Now, uh, that's, that's a low flash number type statement. What is the fluctuation around this Wigner semicircle? And the answer is not terribly surprising that it's Gaussian. Basically, you expect that any fluctuation should be Gaussian in the universe, except when you have a good reason for not being Gaussian. But here, there is something surprising happening. So let me take the, let me set it up. So when you take the trace of FW, this is of course the same as this linear statistics, but now without the one over n normalization. So this is supposed to be a huge number. It's an order n object. You subtract its expectation, fine, fair game. And then the claim is that this one converges weak in a weak sense uh, to a normal distribution, center normal Gaussian with a certain variance and the variance can be computed from the function f it's basically the H1 normal pen. There is an explicit formula for that. But what is surprising here is that you get the you get a central limit theorem, but without the one over square root of n normalization. So you take n random variables and center random variables. You do not divide by square root of n. Nevertheless, you get an order one uh, Gaussian random variable. It's very surprising. Because what we have is that the eigenvalues are, are strongly correlated. A typical central limit theorem would be a sum of weakly correlated random variables. Here, this is not the case. The lambda i's are very strongly correlated. And the strong correlation in particular is expressed by the fact that, that you have a central limit theorem with the, with the wrong scaling, wrong in quotation mark. But nevertheless, after you adjusted the scaling, you, you do recover the Gaussianity. So it's a very, very interesting situation that, that you, are, you, have, you have a central limit theorem in a scaling which should, which should not be central limit theorem scaling, still you get the Gaussian. Now, in addition to that, of course, one can also, one also has to compute the expectation. This is easier. The expectation, the leading term in the expectation is a semicircle, low, but there are also explicit order one corrections, which I don't want to specify here. Now, this, this theorem, uh, the, the CIT for, uh, for uh, linear statistics, this has a very, very long history. Uh, it goes back to the, to the mid 90s, probably. Uh, when people figured out that something like that could be true and proved it in various situations. There are many, many, at least there are 20 papers in the last 20 years which, which proved results of these types. Probably the best, uh, the, the, the strongest one is a paper by Soso and Wong in terms of the regularity, weakening the regularity here, the regularity of the function f. Now, uh, this was done, uh, th this statement was in the, for a fixed f, uh, which we call the macroscopic scale. In other words, we don't scale the, the, the observable function that would correspond to macro scale. But you can do that. You can also do everything in the so-called mesoscopic scale. Then the observable function will be written in such a way that you fix a, fix a function and independent g. And you rescale the, the you rescale, zoom this function out around the fixed energy e. Energy is always in the spectrum. The semicircle specifies the spectrum minus two two, and then you you zoom it out with a scale n to the minus a, where a is between zero and one, and the macroscopic scale corresponds to the a equals zero case, and the mesoscopic scale is basically when, when a bigger the a, you are more in the mesoscopic regime. You don't want to undo, you don't want to overdo it. So typically, a has to be smaller than one because you want to be you want to stay above the uh, eigenvalue spacing. The eigenvalue spacing is one over n in the bulk, and it's one over n to the two third at the edge. So when we talk about mesoscale, we always mean that it's above the eigenvalue spacing. Now the Wigner semicircle still holds uh, with this in this mesoscopic scales as well. This is called a local law. And also, moreover, the mesoscopic CRT also holds, so this much stronger version. In the same way, you have to do the, the, the right normalization. I think it's surprising, but right normalization again means the anomalous normalization. So effectively, this sum here is, contains not n to the, it doesn't contain n terms anymore, it contains a few r terms and to the one minus a term, but no matter what, you are not putting in front of that the one over square root of n. Um, normalization, still you get the Gaussian. Uh, well, uh, the Gaussian result, this was done first by he and uh, Knowles, anti Knowles and uh, the bulk and later on at the, at the edge. So this is also known. Now, the main point of our result is that all these, all these things, all these previous central limit theorems uh, were tracial quantities. So we com they computed a trace of the function of the Wigner 
matrix, which is sensitive only on, which is sensitive to the eigenvalues only. They are insensitive to the eigenvectors. But once we start studying this, what I advertised before, you take the f of w times an deterministic matrix A, and suddenly the eigenvectors come in. So the trace of f w uh, times an A becomes, uh, becomes this quantity, so f lambda i times the, eigen, uh, times the overlap of the corresponding eigenvectors. So now we will study such an object. Of course, when A is the identity matrix, then we go back to the original thing, but this is this is well known. So our main focus is when A is explicitly not the identity matrix. So now, uh, so here is again the, the quantity. So, so I call L and this is the linear, the, the, the center linear statistics. So again, F is the function of the, of the Wigner matrix and A is this deterministic matrix. I always subtract the expectation. And this is what we are trying to understand. Now, what we realized is that it's, it's, it's a good idea to decompose the A into three parts. Actually, this oscillation, this uh, the quantity will oscillate on three different, in three different modes. We call them the tracer, the traceless diagonal, and the off-diagonal parts. And it's done according to the appropriate decomposition of the matrix A. So the matrix A first is decomposing to diagonal and off-diagonal part. Obviously, the diagonal is just a diagonal matrix, off-diagonal is everything else. And on top of that, the diagonal part can be further decomposed into two parts. It can be decomposed to the, to the trace part, which is just a constant matrix times the average, average trace, plus a tracer part, plus a diagonal part, uh, which, is, which has zero trace. So again, this, this circle indicates the, uh, the zero trace, the traceless part of a matrix. And then if you decompose the A, then according to this, this L and this linear statistics decomposes into three parts. The first part is the well-known part. This is just the average trace of A times the uh, tracial linear statistics. But then these two other modes, and we will focus on these, these are the modes which correspond to the octagonal and the traceless part of the diagonal uh, part of the matrix A. It is our theorem about the CRT. Uh, so I formulate the theorem in the most general, uh, general terms. So it, sh it shows that, uh, that we can do it also immediately on the, on the macroscopic and the mesoscopic level. So this A parameter, the zooming parameter can be zero and that can go up to one, at least in the bulk. And here's the statement. So we look at these three modes uh, separately, or rather we look at the joint distribution. But then it turns out that these three modes scale differently, at least in the mesoscopic regime. When A is zero, the macroscopic regime, they are fluctuating on the same scale. But when, when we are in the mesoscopic regime, then this off-diagonal mode and the zero trace diagonal mode, they have a much, more, much smaller fluctuation than the, than the leading term, than the tracial mode. And the smaller fluctuation has to be compensated. It, their size is n to the minus a over two. So they have to be compensated by, 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 by multiplying, by zoom, by, by increasing it, scaling it up by this n to the a over two factor. And after that, this triple will, have a, uh, will become an order one uh, random triple. And it has this, this three limiting distribution or three uh, limiting uh, modes. Um, the tracial mode, the diagonal mode, and the off-diagonal mode, plus, so these are random variables, which I will say a word about that, plus something which is, which is very well controlled, and an error term which is controlled in a very strong sense. So here, the, the, the sense of convergence is in all moments. So you take the, any, any polynomial moments of the right-hand side that we will say as the polynomial, polynomial moments of the right-hand, of the left-hand side modulo the error. And these limiting objects, these are three independent center Gaussian processes. They are all of size over order one. And we can compute their, their variances. In the next slide, I will show a few formulas. But the formulas themselves are, are, quite, are, are quite ugly. These are explicit formulas that just show that we can do that. Now, this was formulated in the bulk. The edge, exactly the same statement holds. Edge, edge means that you, you, you zoom it out at the, at the E, at the energy 2L minus 2, except that the scaling is different. So whenever you see n to the A over 2, this becomes n to the 3A over 4. That the, the, the scaling at the edge is obviously very typical. It's always different than in the bulk. So it will be different in that way. And again, we can do it in all intermediate regime. And also one can take multivariate versions. So one can take different uh, A's 
uh, different uh, linear statistics and put them together, the joint distribution and so on. I mean, interestingly enough, that the, that the tracial mode has been, has been studied very, very extensively. As I said, at least there were 20 papers about that in the, in the history. But the question, what happens to this, to this uh, off-diagonal mode? So when you put in an A and then you focus on the off-diagonal part, this has not been asked. There is only one paper, to our knowledge, by Litova, uh, which considered this question only in the microscopic regime where A equals zero. It's only for the real, symmet uh, the real linear matrix. And especially in her case, there is no scale separation. So because, because the fact that the off-diagonal mode scale on a, uh, fluctuates on a different scale, this is visible only in the, in the mesoscopic scale. This was not visible in the, in the in Litovas paper. So here's, uh, here's a very precise, maybe I'll show the full formula. Don't read it carefully. It's just indicating the fact that actually our result traces various parameters of the random variables very carefully. So it turns out that's actually not usual that when you talk about fluctuations, then it's not only the very not only the, the the variance of the individual matrix elements matter, but also the fourth the the, the kappa four, which is the fourth cumulant of the off diagonal element that comes into the game, and also the 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 second the the, di the second moment of the diagonal element, which could which could differ from the uh, from the from from one that also comes into the game. And we also traced another quantity, which is the expectation of the chi-square of the off diagonal so the square of the off diagonal elements. This is relevant only for the complex case. For the real case, this is just one. But when you are in a complex situation, then it may happen that the, that the off diagonal element is a genuine quantum, a genuine complex variable. So its absolute value is scaled to be one, but its square without the absolute value is not one, it's just another number sigma. And this sigma is actually important. Uh, it shows up all the time because it, it traces, it's sensitive to the symmetry type of the model. So for example, when you talk about the real symmetric Wigner matrix, then the sigma is one because then the, then the chi is the same as its absolute value, it's real. But when it's complex, then very often the complex Wigner matrices are defined in such a way that the, that the square of the diagonal element is zero and then the sigma is zero. And the sigma shows up in, in the explicit formulas. So what you see here, don't read it carefully, what you see here is the, is the variances or the expectation squares of the limiting of this limiting processes. And we have explicit formulas for that. Um, in particular, the explicit formulas involve these additional parameters. Okay. So, um, so here are a few, few remarks about the formulas. Maybe because the time is running, let me not read it very carefully. Uh, what you can read off from the formula, maybe maybe let me just read this last part. Um, so, so what you can read off as a moral of the story from these formulas is that uh, the statistics on smaller scales are more universal. So meaning that when you, when you look at the, the mesoscopic statistics, the mesoscopic statistics uh, is independent of this fourth cumulant and independent of this W2. These are these quantities are visible only on the on the mesoscopic on the macros, microscopic scale on the biggest scale. Uh, the off-diagonal part in general is more universal than the diagonal part. So this quantity uh, for the off-diagonal part this shows up more often in the formulas. And finally, the symmetry type. The symmetry type is descri uh, described by the sigma. This is the most important parameter. This shows up all the times as it's of course expected in any random matrix business. Okay, so that's sort of what the, the conclusions, what you can uh, draw from the general, from the explicit formulas. So let me explain this, this scale separation. is actually the most important, most interesting part of our work, I think. So first of all, if you want to prove uh, central limit theorem, then by the standard half Hersher strand calculus, one can, it's enough to understand everything for the resolvents. I think this is a well-known story in mathematical physics, so let me not spend time on that, how to go from resolvents to general functions. So from now on, I will just focus on resolvents, which I call G. Uh, the eta is the important parameter in the whole business. Eta is always the imaginary part of the resolvent. Uh, which is which is always chosen to be at least on the on the scale on the mesoscopic scale. So when I study a mesoscopic problem, then usually one has to understand this resolvent on the scale eta bigger than n to the minus a. Now, as before, we decompose the deterministic matrix into the tracial and the traceless part. And so a is just uh, just average trace, and a circle 
is whatever is left over. And now you would first you would like to understand the g times a average of g times a. Um, so it has three parts. First of all, it has a deterministic part. It's very well known that basically a, a local law or even a global law that the g, the resolvent at a very first level of uh, resolvent of a random matrix, a very first level can be approximated by the function m. M is a, we always call it m. M is nothing else just the Stirkias transform of the of the semicircle. So this is the the, the, on the crudest level, if you want to understand what G is, on the crudest level, this is M. And this is what happens in the, in the leading term. So for example, if A is the identity matrix, then only this part survives, and then, then the G, uh, average of G is just the M. But this is the deterministic part, and of course, there's a fluctuation on top of that. And now, according to the decomposition of the A, the fluctuation is, the, uh, is split into two parts. The first part is, the, is the, the diagonal fluctuation, which is sensitive only on the trace or average trace of the G. So the G minus M times the average trace of A. This is one fluctuating mode. And there's the other fluctuating mode, the off diagonal, the fluctuation of the off diagonal part, off diagonal mode. And now what you should see here is that they fluctuate on a different scale. The fact that the, the diagonal fluctuation, the average trace of G minus M, Fluctuates on, a, on, fluctuates on a scale one over one over n eta. This is a well-known story. This, this is basically what we call the local law. But then, uh, and this is the new part, when you look at the fluctuation of the G against a, a, a traceless observable, then the fluctuation is actually much smaller. It's one over n times square root of eta. Eta is a small number. We are always interested in the situation when you have a small scale. So then you see that the square root of n means a much smaller fluctuation compared to the n. Uh, square root of eta is a much smaller fluctuation compared to the one over eta or the tracial part. So where does this come, where does this come from? So again, I basically said it already that the local law uh, understand local or together with the asymptotic Gaussianity of this first term, uh, this understands the, the tracial part and now we focus on the, on the traceless part. So this is the statement. So it comes again in two ways. It, first, it comes as an estimate and a priori estimate like a local law. So it says that when A is traceless, and the G times A average is, is bounded by this quantity. The important thing to focus on this N and especially the eta to the one half, compared to the n times eta power in the tracial part. So the eta is a small number, so the one over eta is a much bigger thing than the one over square root of eta. Uh, so this is the, the, the priori bound, which holds with very high probability. And once you have such a bound, it's very natural to ask, okay, so if you multiply through by the size, the inverse of the size, is this true that this is a, this is a Gaussian random variable? And that's, the, that's indeed the case. So this is a central limit theorem version of the same, just the same quantity. So again, notice that the variance of the tracial part is much bigger than the traceless part. But on, on the other hand, one has to understand the traceless part fluctuation as well, because especially if you take a traceless A, then, the, then, then this part here, the, the tracial part, uh, the fluctuation of trace, tracial part is irrelevant because it's multiplied by zero. So in that case, you really have to understand that guy. But on the other, so you have, to, uh, you have to exploit the fact that A is traceless, but this is not an easy thing because if you, if you look at the standard local low proofs, and the standard, the standard local low proof, this one over n eta quantity comes up all the time. This is the natural parameter in which one does all kinds of expansions. It shows up all the time in the proof. And also the local low proofs usually operate with the, uh, with the norm of A and A, uh, either the operator or the Hilbert-Schmidt norm of A, but these quantities cannot distinguish between zero trace and no, no zero and non-zero trace. So one has to, has to exploit that fact and that's our, our main technical contribution. So let me introduce the, the main workhorse of our, of our result. This is, what, this is uh, the spectrally averaged overlap. Here is the quantity, and this, this quantity connects the, the two parts of my talk, the, uh, the, the eigenstate thermalization hypothesis and central limit theorem. So, so we take this overlap, the UI AUJ, 
take the square of that to get a positive quantity times n to, to get an order one normal norm, uh, order one variable. And then you average the average a little bit in the i and the j indices. So you take a little average there. And you, you and you call it lambda square. This is our basic quantity which we study. In particular, uh, if we could prove that the lambda is bounded by order one, roughly speaking, order one, that would immediately give you the, the, the this eigenstate formalization hypothesis. That would give you that all terms here is essentially, uh, essentially bounded by one. Now, why is it a good quantity? First of all, it's a good quantity, but it's a sum of positive terms. So once you understand the lambda square, you will be able to deduce information about individual terms. But on the other hand, it's a good quantity because if you take this, uh, if, you, if you look at the spectral decomposition of something which looks like the, we did it in this way, that imaginary part of G times A times imaginary part of G at another spectral parameter times A, so you look at a quantity of this type, it's a quantity of type GA, GA, average. And this is by spectral decomposition, it looks like that. It's like a, when eta is small, it's like a smoothed out averaging, smoothed out average version of this lambda up here. So basically the lambda square and this quantity is roughly speaking the same, expresses the same, same object, these are some local, spectral local average of this overlap. But and so so on the other, but we really want to understand the lambda. But on the other hand, it, it will be much easier to understand this GA GA average is some kind of smooth and out version of that, because in this way we go back to the resolvents and resolvents are the good guys. So eventually, the goal uh, in order to do all these things is to understand that this GA GA is an order one object, even for very very small a. And you see, this is a non-trivial fact because G itself is a resolvent, a resolvent in norm can be very big. The resolvent in norm can be one over eta. So, but then here you have this additional averaging uh, tested against the zero trace, the, the trace less a, so it makes much smaller. Okay, so that's the, that's our main main goal or main object. And uh, let me just, so, so the, 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 the main part of the proof is that, that proving that lambda is smaller than one, but let's just see how one can deduce from that and almost everything else. So for a while, let me assume that the lambda is already proven that lambda is bounded by one. Let me say, let me understand this G times A, what, it, what is the conclusion for that. Uh, the G times A, again, write up in spectral decomposition, the one over n comes from the normalized trace. Uh, now, if you, knew that, if you knew that lambda is order one, then you know that this overlap here is bounded by square root of n, you can pull it out. And then you get this sum here. Now this sum is basically the, 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 the Riemann sum of the one over lambda minus z. So you can compute it. It has a, up to a logarithmic factor. Logarithmic factor is basically one over square root of n. So this already tells you that this g times a, the, the size of this g times a for zero trace a is a further one over square root of n, much, much smaller than the same than, than without zero trace a. But actually the truth is much better because within this sum here, there is an effective central limit theorem type cancellation. This is still a sum involving many terms, and the sum involves terms which are which are fluctuating themselves. So now, if you if you look at it more carefully, this sum this term this sum here actually has only n times f, n times eta effective terms. So if you by hand put in the central limit theorem. So instead of taking one over square root of n, you normalize it by an additional one over square root of n eta, accepting the fact that there's an additional central limit theorem effect going on in this sum, then altogether you get actually the truth, what I claimed before, so that the g, g times a for trace less a scales like uh, has a size of one over n square root of eta. Of course, this was everything is heuristic, all these things have to be proven, but this just indicates what the truth is. And this should be compared with the usual average local law, which is, which, is the, which is basically a tracial part of that when you take G minus M and test it against any matrix, but without any deterministic matrix, but without the zero trace condition, then the same thing, the same, uh, same result would give us, uh, then the result would be one over N eta. Again, uh, the trace less part gives you one over N square root of eta. So it means that you gain, you gain a square root of eta due to the traceless thing. And this is quite remarkable because normally one would expect that if you start improving these, these local laws, and this is more for those who, 
who are familiar with this technique, then usually you can get an expansion in powers of one over n eta. But in powers of one over n eta, you will never get a one over n square root of eta. So there is something else, uh, something else going on here. It's, you don't get just by, 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 by pure expansion. Okay, so now let me let me just still go on with the, with the 2G because this is exactly what we need, the GA, GA. Again, assuming that lambda has been proven, that lambda is order one, then at least you see the consistency, then you do the same kind of spectral decomposition. If you knew that the UAU is bounded by one, over, uh, it's lambda is bounded by one over square root of M, then basically the same calculation tells you that the GA, GA is order one. Now, uh, previous, uh, the spectral theorem told you that the lambda square is comparable with GA, GA. So of course, this line is almost a tautology. It just tells you that if you knew that lambda is smaller than one, then you conclude that lambda is smaller than one. But nevertheless, this argument will be the key to prove it. This kind of spectral decomposition is the key to prove it eventually that lambda is smaller than one. So by the way, and this is only a bound, one can also get a local law, which we call the two resolvent local law for GA, GA, but let me not go into that. Um, okay, so maybe let's just uh, jump over that. These are some analysis of that, that one can improve the local law, which is typically for a single G, one can improve it to, to, to two G as well. So now, I mean, time is, time is running quickly, but let me just, I have still two or three slides. So let me just indicate very quickly, I mean, every talk should contain some proof so let me just indicate very quickly how one proves local laws. And I will present it through a proof, which is an old proof. This is the, the standard local law proof for the tracial quantity. But uh, then I will be able to say a word about how to, to improve it for the non-tracial part. So the, the typical, um, the best proof of the local law goes along the following way. You write up the resolvent identity in this form. So G is the resolvent of the W, you write it, write it up in this form and compare it to the deterministic equation M, M was the stiltless transfer of the semicircle and this satisfies this deterministic equation. I put them together because, they, because then, 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 then when, when you put these two equations together, you subtract these two equations from each other, then and you reorganize it a little bit, then you get the following equation for G minus M, average G minus M. It's like a self-consistent equation on the right left hand side you have a one minus m square constant times the quantity which you want to understand. And on the right hand side, you have the same quantity squared, but remember the quantity is supposed to be small. So hopefully this square will be negligible compared to the leading term and plus a fluctuating term, which I call this underlying term W times G. And the underlying term is just the WG, uh, W times uh, the matrix, uh, Wigner matrix times its resolvent plus another term, which is the average G times G. Uh, this is in physics term, this is the, the one loop renormalization of the WG, because if you take the average, the expectation of this WG, and you do only the, uh, the, the, the first cumulant expansion, you assume that this is Gaussian and you ignore everything else, then you exactly get the expectation of that. So this is the, the standard that for renormalization. So you put in and then, you look at this equation again, suppose that you can ignore the, the quadratic term compared to the linear term, and then you see that the G minus M is essentially bounded by this renormalized version of the WG. So this is the, this is the, the key point to estimate the, the G minus M. And now you just have to prove that this under, that this normal, this renormalized WG is small, but you have to prove it in high moment sense because you want to prove a, a high probability statement. And then you start working. So you start computing, say, the variance of that to start with. You do the variance, you do a cumulant expansion. Here I just wrote up the very first term in the cumulant expansion, which, which, which you would get if W is Gaussian, and it looks like that is GG or GG star, and then plus another term, which is GG star square. So now uh, look at this inequality here. You have a, you, you seem that you may have a problem because you want to, want to understand a single G. Okay, single G is the same as the WG. Now the WG in, res, in, in variant sense involves understanding GG. So after you take the square root here, understanding WG requires to understand, understand GG. So it looks like that understanding. What's the algebra line? Pardon? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Hello. 
Hello. I think this wasn't a question, Laszlo. It was just uh, just uh, somebody forgot to un Oh, I see. Okay, then I can go. Yeah, I'm almost done. So just to finish it quickly. So so once more. So in order in order to understand a single G, you have to understand WG underlined. In order to understand WG, even in, in, in uh, very sense, you have to understand the two G. And so on. So it looks like a, it looks like a, a, a baby version of what is called a BBGK by hierarchy. To understand single G, you have to understand the two G, and to understand the two G, you have to understand four G, and so on. It looks like an endless story. But here you have a lucky situation, which of course happens very often. You use the word identity. The GG styles the imaginary part of G over eta. So in the word identity, you are able to go back from two G to one G. So 2g square, it's 1g square. That's very important because that means that you, in the high, you, you, you close the hierarchy, to truncate the hierarchy, stop the hierarchy. Now, if you, if you realize that and you use it, you have to use it twice, then you get an inequality of the form that first you get that the g is smaller than order one, the m is the order one part, times something which involves g times one over m eta. So then, of course, you conclude first that the G is order one, and then you put it into the estimate again, and then you get the G minus M is one over N eta. Don't follow the details. It is actually a very easy um, analysis here. The key point is this line here, that this word identity allowed you to, uh, allowed you to reduce the, the G power. So it, allow, it, it avoided uh, such an inequality like that. Suppose that you try to do this a typical problem in BBG KY story. You try to understand a quantity called X, and you get a bound which involves X, X squared, sometimes even with a small coefficient in front of that. But still, this is useless as it stands if you don't know anything about X. But here, the X squared goes back to X by the word identity. So this is when you do the, the tracer part. Now, suppose that you want to repeat the same thing for the, when you have an A here. Then there is no word identity. The corresponding thing instead of the G, G star would have an A in between. And you cannot have word identity there. Of course, you can do a Schwartz inequality at that stage. But if you do a Schwartz inequality, so estimate the G, A, G star A by G, G star, then you lose the effect of the, of the zero trace. And the, the Schwartz inequality is insensitive to that. So you have to do something about it. And that's, and, and then that's, then that's, what, that's what our main work is, is doing. So you do the same kind of estimate. But then when you do the cumulant expansion, then you have to take into account the A. A appears everywhere in the cumulant expansion. Now you have to estimate these terms carefully, but carefully meaning that you have to keep track of the, of the, of the, country, of, of the traceless effect of the A. And, um, and then if I knew that this lambda, this, this basic object, this overlap is already bounded, then in these estimates, I can use the spectral theorem and I can, and the spectral theorem effectively estimates this tracelessness of A. And then I, if I put everything together, I get at least in variance sense what I expect. Now, the main problem here is, so it looks good. I mean, I have an A, and then I take the, the variance of this WGA, I have two A's everywhere. So I, I can hope that the A will always help. The A is a traceless object. It makes quantities smaller than they look like, except the key difficulty that some of this, uh, these good A's become useless. For example, you get a term when the A stands next to A star. When A is next to A star, then it loses the, the effect. It loses its, its attribute to be zero trace. Then the G A A star G star is not better than G G star. So here you lose the effect. So now we have, what we have to do, we have to very carefully trace when, when you lose it and how to gain back what you lose. And this I'm not going to explain in any details anymore. So in, uh, technically what we do, we take a high moment expansion of that. It's a horrible big expansion of terms of that type. We have to identify those A's which are effective where the zero trace effect can be exploited. And then whenever some A is lost, then we have to look for an additional smallness and all these things are done, and, and all these things are done by delicate bookkeeping by Feynman diagrams, but this I'm not going to explain, don't have time. So let me just finish how, how, to, pro how to prove the basic object, the lambda is smaller than one. Now you can imagine when you have all these things, then all these ideas together, you just put it together. So again, the lambda square is basically this GA, GA. 
the GAGA by, this, uh, by, by, the, by the equation, corresponding equations is basically the same as its underlying version, this WGAGA renormalized version. For that guy, we can get again, uh, again uh, a high momentum expansion in the, the Feynman graphs. Only in the, if I do one in the second moment, it looks like that. And then in the second moment part, uh, again, I keep the leading term. Everything else has to be again estimated. And I get a term, so I started with which has GG. I have to estimate something which has 4G, but this one by spectral theorem I can estimate in terms of lambda. That's the key point here. So you can go back to lambda. And then again, you get and you get some, some, some small factor. So altogether you get an inequality that the lambda to the four is bounded by lambda to the four times a small number. So you get a Gromwell inequality, which eventually finishes the proof. And again, the important thing is the spectral theorem. Yeah, I wrote it out the spectral theorem showing that how the, not just for GA, GA, but even for longer chains of Gs and As, you can express the size of that in terms of the lambda in an obvious way spectral theorem. So that's the main message what, what you should take home, that a cumulant expansion, if you do naively, would generate an infinite BBGK by hierarchy. So if you want to understand 2G, you have to understand the 4G and, and so on. It looks like hopeless. Always the key question how to truncate it. Uh, our uh, typically in, in many other situations, typically when, for example, we did it for the for the Gross Pitayevsky equation, when we did it for Boltzmann equation, then usually some Schwartz inequality or some word, in a, word identity truncates that. But this one we cannot do because all these things lose the, the effect of the zero trace, the tracelessness of A. But here, this quantity lambda along this argument manages to close the hierarchy. So that's the main message. And this is my last slide as a summary. So what we proved is that we proved this eigenstate thermalization hypothesis saying that for Wigner matrices, the eigenvector overlaps with any deterministic matrix is as small as if they were completely random vectors. And we proved this functional CRT, which is an extension, the usual, uh, usual CRTs uh, for the linear statistics towards including deterministic matrices and identifying these three fluctuation modes on different scale. And then in particular, the achievements is that we improve, improve local loads, taking into account the effect of traceless observables. We also did multi G local loads, this I didn't write it up. Uh, with uh, the, the technically, we close the hierarchy with this quantity lambda, and along the way, we have to do a big diagrammatic expansion with the goal to extract the tracelessness. So that's sort of the main message to take home, and I stop here. Thanks very much for the attention. Yeah, thank you very much, Lassie. Let's all unmute and applaud so that it feels a little bit more like a normal <laughs> seminar. So. Yeah, so thanks very much for this beautiful talk. Um, questions, comments, please raise your hand in the system or just speak up. Yeah, I'd have a question. Uh, yeah, hi, Lars here. Uh, thanks a lot for the very nice talk. Uh, I. I, I presume the, the, the assumption, I have a question about the assumptions of your model. I presume the assumption of identical distribution is made for convenience. And you could probably, uh, if you worked a bit harder, that could. I, I, we, haven't really, we haven't really worked on that yet. I mean, this is a long term project, certainly. As usual in this business, I mean, usually one starts with the Wigner, Wigner situation, and if algebra is easier in that case. And then the next, next step will be the, what we call the, the Wigner type matrix when you still have identity, when you still have independence, but we will drop the identical distributions in particular, we will allow the octagonal terms having non zero not, not constant variance profile. And then after that one can try to do the correlated case as well. So here we didn't do that. This is only for the for the standard Wigner case. The only thing what we did is that, as I said, we distinguish between the diagonal and the off diagonal part. Uh, mainly in order to bring into the game these additional parameters with this, this W2 parameters, which is sensitive to the moment of the, of the diagonal, second moment of the diagonal part, 
and also also we trace the, the, the kappa for the fourth moment and also this sigma which is which is relevant for the for the complex situation so we trace these particular parameters because they are interesting and they were traditionally traced also in similar uh, linear statistics work uh, but certainly in the future we have to we have to do more general situation more general with that type matrices and so I, I wanted to ask you exactly about that yes yeah, so relaxing these variance profiles so so how how different do you expect it to be so <laughs> first regarding the, um, the results do you expect the result to be the same and secondly do you expect the proofs to be very different I mean more more rarely the result should be the same I mean a high level the result should be the same. Uh, the proof will be somewhat different. I mean, I mean, in many cases we use, uh, uh, we, we use. I mean, in this business, uh, in many cases, in many of the estimates, especially in this diagrammatic estimate, estimate use the fact we use the fact that it's easy to sum up indices. I mean, this is a very technical thing, but I mean, you know it very well that in very often in this diagrammatic diagrammatic expansion, use the fact that the resolvents are summed up, uh, resolvents with indices. Are summed up in a convenient way, and that uses the fact that the that the, that the variance uh, uh, which comes up naturally in the cumulant expansion and the variance does not depend on the indices. So this is as this is something which which will be an additional complication. But I mean we have some some preliminary calculations and some some concrete ideas how to do that. So I, I'm I'm confident that we will be able to do it in this general case as well. But I don't want to claim any. Is that for the moment? Okay, thanks. Okay, maybe I ask a question first, the technical one. You you made the assumption that all moments exist of your randomness. Is this uh, something very technical, or do you expect something to happen when you have uh, only finitely many? Oh, no, I'm so this so this the the, the, the condition when all moments. Fine, I, uh, all moments are bounded. This is a very convenient, uh, very convenient condition which we use in, in basically in all our papers. It's not necessary, but uh, but it's necessary if you want to state the result in this very strong form. You see, our results. Well, can I say? Well, can I show results on that? Um, so our results are always stated in the form with high probability, with very high probability. This is something which is it's a technical term. It says, like, uh, I even didn't define it very precisely. It basically says the following that, that for any epsilon, an arbitrary small epsilon, the probability that this guy is violated is smaller than n to the minus any power. You know, so the, uh, the technical way of saying that given any epsilon and given any, given any small epsilon and, can, and a big D, the probability that this one is, is, is violated is smaller than one over n to the D if n is sufficiently big. So if you want to get a, a, a very high probability result in this sense, in this really strong sense, then you need, then you need uh, high moments estimates. But of course, you may relax that. You may say that you don't want to get it in so high probability. You would be happy with a probability with one over n squared or something like that, or exceptional set in one over n squared. And then you could do it weak. Then you can do it with less uh, conditions. But technically, it's getting harder. I mean, our, our proofs are, are very much tailored. Our whole setup is very much tailored to be able to deal with this, this concept of very high probability. There will be quite a lot of complications if you tell me that this is only 10 moments. It's, it's, everything is doable, but it's, but it's technical. Now, of course, you cannot go below uh, something, some moments. I mean, second moments are certainly needed. These are already assumed here. But more than second moments, at least fourth moments are needed if you want to do it. An analysis at the edge. So, if, if there is no fourth moment, then even the edge situation doesn't work. And there are people that there are various works which analyze local laws and so on under the condition of weaker moments. Uh, we didn't do that. We, that was not our main focus. It's always the game that that one has to one has to focus on something and then then put the more strong stringent conditions in other aspects. So, it's, I mean, here we focused in this in this zero trace story and so on, but. Uh, we didn't. We didn't try to improve this condition. Certainly, I mean the, the, that it, 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 it required for all p. This is not necessary. I mean, sufficiently high p is certainly necessary. But if you ask me to prove it for only un, only under the condition p equal ten, 
And first of all, the statement will look a little bit different, and then many steps will look a bit uglier because I have to keep track carefully what it, how bad the bad set is. Yeah. Okay. So then if there's no other question, let me ask a general question about this eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. Um, of course, your result says that within Wigner matrices with, well, very high probability it, it holds. I mean, it's maybe a little bit related to Auntie's question. Uh, um, what if you had a band matrix or something like this? Do you, Yes, I mean, I mean that's of course another very natural, <laughs> very natural direction. I mean, uh, all these things are supposed to hold as long as you're in a delocalized regime. I mean, that's sort of what one, one expects. So, so certainly, I, I expect uh, more or the same thing, and maybe not with the square root of m in that way. Uh, more or the same thing should hold at least in band matrices when the bandwidth is bigger than a bigger than square root of n. Actually, in that case, probably only one over square root of n is still correct. Uh, but I mean, this is this is yet to be done. So I mean, uh, um, uh, there is a big, big philosophy behind that, a big uh, general picture that, that all these things, I even said it here, that, that, that as long as it's sufficiently chaotic, then, then all this QE, QE we should hold. I mean, these are all to be, to be discussed and to be, uh, to be studied in the future future projects. I mean, compared to Antti's question, the band matrices are much harder than, than variant, uh, varying, the non-constant variance profiles, because then, then you have to, then suddenly this, uh, the, the typical scaling, the one over, one over n data scaling gets jeopardized. So then, it, then it's getting much harder. And, um, and of course, I mean, the bandwidth is very, very narrow. So once you are below the critical bandwidth, bandwidth is smaller than square root of n, then, then all kinds of other phenomena happen. And then the localization length is, small, is smaller, then you will have eigenfunctions, which are not, uh, not, are not completely delocalized, and then, then it starts deteriorating. But yes, I mean, this is certainly one of the main directions when one would like to go along this way. And this is sort of the very first step. And, from the, and then this hierarchy, the Wigner matrices, is, is the first step to do if you want to understand this question for chaotic systems. Okay, thank you. Are there any further questions, comments? Well, I, uh, I don't see any. So lastly, thank you very much again for your nice talk and the discussion. And uh, we the, the seminar will take place again next month with the talk by Roberto Longo. So thanks everyone for coming. Thanks Lassie for your talk and see you soon. Okay, thanks very much for the attention. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Goodbye. Bye.